and welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to mention about this background. Uh, apparently, a lot of people really hate it. So, I just wanted to let everybody know this is actually temporary. I have a really elaborate plan for a really nice background with all the crazy stuff going on right now. I just haven't had time to do it. So, um, just be warned, uh, you're going to have to live with this for a couple more episodes and then hopefully it'll be gone. So, <laughs> so anyway, so I know I said in the last video on Petski Robots that it would probably be the last video on Petski Robots unless there was something else more interesting to talk about. Well, it turns out there are actually quite a few interesting things to talk about. And so, including the Apple II port, uh, which we'll be talking about at the second half of this video. So, uh, stick around for that and let's dig right in. At this point, the game has been on sale for several months and I've already shipped somewhere around 600 copies. Unlike Planet X3, I decided this time not to do a Kickstarter and just tackle the orders as they come in. And so I've been shipping around 10 to 20 boxes per day, which means uh, some people had to wait several weeks for their order to ship. But I've finally caught up. And while 10 or 20 boxes doesn't seem like it would take a lot of time, it really does. Um, one of the biggest bottlenecks is making the discs. Now I've had some occasional help. Um, before the devastating storm we had, I had a small copy party in the uh, partially completed studio. It was just three of us who uh, basically all work from home and live in quarantine on most days anyway, so we figured it was low risk for COVID. Uh, oh, and uh, on a tangent about that, I did finally get vaccinated for COVID, so I can start having a little more human interaction now. Um, anyway, uh, the discs for Petsky Robots take twice as long as usual because I have to flip the disc and then write the VIC-20 version on the back side. Of course, folding the boxes takes just as long as it did with Planet X3, so if you include making the discs and folding the boxes, it takes about seven minutes to build and ship a box. Now multiply that by 20 boxes in a day and you have about two hours and 20 minutes. And don't forget, I'm still selling uh, my previous two games alongside Petski Robots. So I'm, I'm still shipping at least one, two or three copies of Planet X3 every day. And so you combine that with the Petski Robots and the trip to the post office and I'm easily spending, you know, between two or three hours every day uh, shipping stuff. Uh, by the way, a lot of people have asked where I get my boxes and manuals made. I've actually used several different places over the years, but uh, currently I'm working with a small print shop just about three miles from my home called Foxy Propaganda. <laughs> They're printing all of my boxes for all of my games now, as well as the user manuals, which uh, come packaged like this. And they're also making my disc sleeves for me. Um, the only printed materials they're not making are the disc labels, which come in rolls like this. And I get those from uprinting.com. And so hopefully that helps answer that for everybody that keeps asking. In the last video, I got a lot of feedback, both in the comments field and direct emails, warning me about the use of the red colored cross on the med kit, uh, saying I might get sued by the red cross for doing this. Uh, and at first I didn't take it too seriously because I'd actually based the design of the med kit um, off the one in Duke Nukem 3D, which looks exactly the same. But then later I found out that apparently this change happened in 2007 and even current versions of Duke 3D have had to change the med kit. So that got my attention. And to be honest, I think it's just a little bit ridiculous. I mean, the Red Cross, they say they don't want to dilute the image of the Red Cross. Well, I can't think of any better way to solidify the meaning of that Red Cross as being something that's like, you know, healthy or good for you than to have it used in like a bunch of video games as, uh, you know, med kits or health packs or whatever. <laughs> Nevertheless, I decided to change the symbol from a red cross to a red H instead, uh, so to stand for health. <laughs> and I had to change it in all three versions of the game that existed at the time, and I was lucky enough to be able to rush the changes to the printers who were getting ready to print the boxes and manuals, so fortunately the correct emblem is shown there as well. The first thing I wanted to talk about is the sound and music in the pet version. Now, in the last video, the pet version did not yet have sound working, and this was originally going to be coded by Alex Semenov, but this never actually happened due to a long list of reasons I'm not going to go into here. But, uh, however, he did make the code available as a free standalone demo called Faulty Robots uh, that you can download or just watch on YouTube. The music is quite incredible for the pet, and it's really unfortunate we weren't able to get it to work with the game. Uh, that being said, I developed my own pet sound tracker, which uh, works on a more conventional approach for pet music. Uh, Noel did design the soundtrack on this as well, but the tunes are not the same as the C64 tunes. It was deemed too difficult to get those tunes to even be recognizable uh, using this tracker system. 
You see, the PET sound system isn't really a sound system at all. It's just using a serial handshake register on one of the I.O. chips, which is uh, accessible via the user port. Now, you can program the frequency on it, but it's limited to about three octaves. Uh, in fact, early PETs didn't even have a speaker, and if you wanted to have sound, uh, you'd have to build a user port interface. Now, one interesting thing I noticed when coding the music is that it didn't sound right in the uh, Vice emulator. I mean, if you take a listen, you'll hear that some of the notes are louder than others, and uh, some you can barely hear, and some have this weird harmonic to them. Having never programmed sound on the PET before, I just assumed this was the nature of the hardware, uh, but I noticed when testing on my mini PET that the sound was very consistent from note to note. And at first I thought it was just the newer hardware of the mini PET, but then when I tested on a real PET, I also discovered the sound was totally fine there. It seems only in the emulator does it sound bad. Uh, later this was determined to be a bug in the Vice emulator and has since been fixed in the latest unstable builds. Alex's version of the sound, on the other hand, uses one of the timers and the CPU interrupt to create tones much lower than what the pet could normally do. And while it does sound great, uh, it does have the side effect of being a lot more complex and CPU intensive. Speaking of sound, here's the Super Nintendo adapter that ships with every boxed copy of the game. And for pet users, we added in this uh, sound jack. Now this is handy for older pets that don't have an internal speaker, but also handy for any pet if you wanted to connect amplified speakers. I have also released a shareware version for the pet that has two maps and a few missing features, and uh, you can download that for free from my website, and I'll, uh, I'll put a link in the description. And while we're on the topic of this device, I wanted to mention the reason that certain things are designed the way they are. Uh, the user ports on the PET, VIC-20, C64, and PLUS4 all look visually the same. They're a 24 conductor cartridge connector. However, there are significant differences in the way some of them are wired up. Uh, for example, the PET, VIC-20, and C64 all have eight general purpose I.O. lines located here. I mean, uh, sure, they aren't controlled from the same memory addresses, but from a hardware perspective, this part of the user port is the same. Um, the Plus 4, however, has a crazy layout, and some of the I.O. pins are on the top and some are on the bottom. As such, the Plus 4 was really the main limiting factor where we could put the three lines we needed for clock latch and data, the three lines needed to run the shift register in an SNES controller. Another problem is that the PET user port doesn't always have 5 volts available, depending on the model. As such, Kevin put this jumper here on the bottom, and uh, what this does is if the jumper's on, then it draws power from the user port. If you remove it, then you need to add your own 5 volt power source to this pin here. Now, um, if you have a VIC-20 or C64, then you don't need to worry about this, just leave the jumper on. And now I'd like to show you a little montage of how these adapters are built at Texelec. Now he's already manufactured somewhere around 600 of these, and uh, I've contracted at least 1,000 units, so um, <laughs> as you can imagine, it takes a while to build them all.
while this looks like a lot, this is only a couple of hundred units, and I've already shipped over 600 boxes at this point. Uh, so hopefully that gives a little context to how many of these are out there. In fact, uh, because there are so many of these in existence now, it only makes sense for other games to start supporting it. In fact, a new game has just come out called Retaliate DX. It's a uh, space shooter type game with an interesting twist. And uh, as you can see in the main menu, you get the option to switch to an SNES controller. Now in the game's manual, it just refers to it as the Texelec adapter. But uh, as you can see, it does make use of several buttons, which is really nice compared to the Commodore joystick. In fact, uh, Texelec is now selling this adapter by itself if uh, anyone needs to buy one for use with other games. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Uh, my friend Chris Hasledge has designed a 3D printable case for the adapter, uh, which you can print yourself or buy from a third party already made. And I'll put the details in the description field. So there's sort of this unspoken rule that uh, when you're coding bitmap graphics for the C64, you really shouldn't use single horizontal pixels on the screen. If you've ever looked at the PET or VIC-20 font, you'll see a lot of single pixels used. In fact, it's used everywhere, and that's because the PET had a built-in monochrome monitor that was capable of displaying fine detail. And the VIC-20 had such low resolution that a single pixel was pretty darn big anyway. Uh, but when the C64 came out, the resolution was nearly doubled, and this means that on a television display, single pixels might not show up well. So what they did was double the width of the built-in character set so that this issue was reduced. Well, a lot of the graphics on Petsky Robots uses single horizontal pixels in places. Uh, okay, actually in pretty much every tile. Um, well, when I was developing the game on the emulator, of course everything looked fine. And it also looked fine on a Commodore monitor using their separated Lumachroma system. And to be fair, even somewhat to my surprise, it looked fine on my television set using composite video. And so I thought I was essentially in the clear, but uh, then one day my bread bin was having problems and so I started using my 64C. And again, the video on a Commodore monitor looked just fine. But when I put it on a television, I suddenly discovered the game looked awful. It turns out, not all Commodore 64s are equal in their ability to display crisp color composite signal. Um, as such, uh, part of the game looks extremely dark. I mean, you could hardly see the difference between the concrete, the grass, or even the inside tile, which is supposed to be blue. Uh, don't get me wrong, the game is still playable, and uh, I found that if I turn the brightness level way up on the TV, it, it helps some. And I know this will be a minority of people that, that uh, have just this right combination of hardware to look this way, but I feel kind of bad about it. So I at least wanted to let people know that you can improve it by using a better monitor or possibly a different revision of the C64 motherboard. So shortly after the last Petsky Robots video went up, I got contacted by these two guys, uh, Ian and Stefan, um, asking for the source code to see if they could port to the Apple II. And to be honest, I was a little bit skeptical, and that's mostly because I've had probably 100 people ask for the source code for Planet X3, saying they were going to port it to another system, and to this date, they're around about zero working uh, ports of the <laughs> of the game. So, so I was actually just a little bit concerned as to if the Apple II would even be capable of doing such a game like this. Uh, and, and I knew that there was going to be a lot of challenges to overcome, but uh, they managed to do it. And, and uh, I'm going to talk about some of those challenges. Of course, the uh, pet version is based on Petsky graphics, and the uh, VIC-20 and C64 use a custom character set uh, to make it look even better. Unfortunately, the uh, Apple II character set has essentially no graphics characters to work with at all, and what's worse is it can't be changed to add in a custom character set. Fortunately, the Apple II does have a bitmap graphics display that we could use, but that presents other challenges. The resolution of the Apple II is 280 by 192 pixels, which is just a little bit less than the Commodore's 320 by 200 resolution. Still, this alone isn't a deal breaker. Um, however, there was a more serious problem. Uh, the Commodore systems use a sane system where uh, 8 bits of data, or one whole byte, equals 8 pixels on the screen. The Apple II, on the other hand, uses an insane system where 8 bits of data only produces 7 pixels. And that's because bit 7 is the palette bit. Now, you might be wondering what difference this makes. Uh, to answer that, we'll have to dive a little deeper. As you know, the game works off an 11 by 7 tile play field, and each one of these tiles is broken down into 9 characters, or sub-tiles if you want to call them that. And each of these sub-tiles is 8 by 8 pixels in size. So you do a little math, and uh, you can see that the tiles are 24 by 24 pixels square. Now, on the Commodore systems, this works out fine because that's 3 bytes of RAM across each tile. 
but on the Apple II that works out to a crazy 3.428 bytes across. <laughs> now, technically speaking, you could still make this work, but the math becomes complicated and the code would be very slow and complex. So uh, Ian decided to change the shape of the tiles and instead make them a little bigger uh, and now using only six subtiles. Uh, now they're 28 pixels across, which works out to a nice even four bytes on the Apple II. Of course, this creates a new problem. If you attempt to maintain the grid of 11 by 7 tiles, you now wind up needing 308 pixels across. But as mentioned earlier, that's more than the Apple II can even do. Uh, one solution is to remove a column and reduce it to 10, which technically speaking that would work and solve the problem because now it's only 280 pixels, a perfect match. But because the play field is no longer an odd number, it's impossible to put the player character in the center now. Uh, so this just wouldn't work. So instead, Ian came up with the idea to put half a tile on each side like this. And now there was just one more problem to solve. On the Commodore versions, the right hand side shows your selected weapons and other items. But since the Apple II version will consume the whole screen, there isn't room for a dedicated space. So instead, the weapons and items are overlaid over the map at the corners like this. It's not a perfect solution, but it works. And so the only fully working Apple II system I have at the moment is my Apple IIc. So uh, let's hook it up and take a look. As you can see, I already have the labels in. Here it is compared with the Commodore version. As you can see, we changed the color a little bit for some contrast. So uh, let's try booting it up. Now, I don't have one of the official Apple IIc green screen monitors that are often shown with the IIc, but I have the next best thing, which is this tiny little uh, Tandy Monochrome monitor, which is just slightly larger and has about the same picture quality. And here we are at the main menu. Uh, now, I'd like to point out just one more time that this port was not done by me. It was done by these guys. Although, most of the underlying 6502 code comes uh, straight from the PET version. And so here we are. This is on the little monochrome monitor and it is totally playable like this, but um, let's try a color television. Now, this is my favorite Samsung TV that I use on everything. <laughs> and I'll just switch the video cable over and uh, there we go. Actually, I think it looks surprisingly good considering the limited color palette of the Apple II high res mode. And uh, I think it actually looks better on this TV than it does in the emulators I've tried. Uh, for some reason, they just don't capture the essence of Apple II color graphics as well as a real CRT. But uh, interestingly enough, my favorite Apple II system isn't an Apple at all. It's uh, my Laser 128. And uh, for those that don't know, this is a clone of the Apple II systems produced by VTech back in the day. And in some ways, I think they made a better Apple <laughs> than Apple themselves. Uh, one of the reasons I like playing on this laser is because it has a number pad, which is supported by the game. Uh, this makes the keyboard arrangement similar to the original pet layout, which is how I designed the game in the first place. The other thing I like about the laser is that it has this mono color toggle switch. And for those that aren't familiar with Apple II platform, uh, this comes in handy. A real Apple II monitor usually has this control on it uh, called the color killer. And the reason you'd want to do this is to sharpen the text or any monochrome graphics because the color signal on the Apple II ends up blurring things together. And uh, that's why you get rainbow colored text in color mode. But with the laser, you get this feature regardless of what sort of monitor you have. So uh, I can test out the monochrome mode on my color TV. And so, uh, these are the two machines I've done many hours with the beta testing on, and I'm happy to say it runs perfectly. And there's another little trick I wanted to tell you about. So, being that we're running in graphics mode, there's a lot more data to copy to the screen than the Commodore version that uses character mode. In fact, it's over five times more data. I honestly didn't think Ian would be able to make it run this fast, but he did. And uh, here's another trick he used. So, if you look at the grid here, you may notice that uh, on any given screen, a lot of the tiles are the same. And so if you were to imagine, if you needed to shift the whole screen over, these gray areas are the only areas that actually changed. As such, there's no need to redraw the other tiles on the screen that remain the same. And uh, while this may not seem like a lot of savings, believe it or not, only 38 out of 77 tiles changed, uh, which works out to about 49% or less than half. As such, there's easily a 50% speed boost to be had by doing this. Another neat thing about the Apple II version is that we have three tile sets you can pick from at the main menu. Now you've already seen the color tiles, so let's change it to Petski. Now in this mode, uh, the artists tried to copy the look of the Petski version as closely as possible. Now granted, it's not real Petski since we're still operating in graphics mode, it's just designed to look like Petski. And after all, we couldn't call this game Attack Petski Robots if there was no Petski in it, right? <laughs> and uh, this mode works best on a monochrome monitor or an Apple monitor that has the option for color killer. Now, we also have another tile set just for monochrome tiles. 
Now, you might wonder why we need a tile set for that. After all, you can run the color tile set on a monochrome monitor and it looks, well, you know, not bad. But uh, remember that an Apple II has essentially twice the resolution when operating on a monochrome monitor uh, due to the way the color system works on it. So, why not create a tile set that can take advantage of that? And so that's exactly what we have here. And um, if you have it connected to a little bit more blurry device, like a black and white television, you'll get a nice grayscale from uh, some of the dithering patterns, which looks pretty nice. So um, there you go, three different tile sets, but the game does play identical regardless of which tile set you choose. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about sound. Now on a regular Apple II system, you get the regular old beeper speaker, and it does play a tune at the main menu. In fact, this is the same tune you get on the Commodore PET at the main menu. And uh, during gameplay, you get some basic sound effects. Um, however, as you can hear, there's no in-game music. Now, the PET actually has in-game music, as we discussed earlier, but it's turned off by default. The Apple II version has no music during gameplay, and the reason may surprise you. Uh, believe it or not, the Apple II systems have no hardware timers on board. Even the lowly PET has four timers built into its I.O. chips here. Uh, these can be used for all sorts of things when you need exact timing for something. In fact, one of these timers runs the system interrupt. And uh, yep, on all Commodore machines, the 6502 actually has an IRQ pin, which is tied to one of these timers. Now, this allows it to fire off an IRQ 60 times per second. Now, for those that don't know, uh, here's how an IRQ works. Um, the CPU is just moving along, executing code like normal. And then when it receives the IRQ pulse, it literally stops everything it's doing and then runs a separate piece of code stored in a predetermined location. And when it finishes this code, it'll return back to the exact place it was before the IRQ pulsed. Now, this is actually one of the first types of preemptive multitasking on personal computers. Now, Commodore machines uh, use this interrupt cycle to scan the keyboard and update all sorts of housekeeping things um, in the background. The Apple II has no such timer and no such IRQ. Everything on the Apple II is done by counting CPU cycles. And if you aren't doing anything complex, like sitting in a main menu, then sure, you can play little tunes and stuff like that. But once you're playing a game and it, it becomes incredibly difficult to keep track of how much time has passed and thus be able to play music. And that's why very few Apple II games have music playing during gameplay. However, all is not lost. You see, there was this card called the Mockingboard. It's sort of considered the de facto standard in music cards for Apple II systems. It was never widely supported at the time, though, because it was very expensive, and I think only a little over 30 original games supported it. Um, however, most any game released in modern times does support it, and uh, Petsky Robots is no exception. <laughs> now, besides giving us a couple of AY3 sound chips, it also gives us two 6522 chips just like the Commodore systems have. This gives us four timers to work with now, uh, making it not only possible to play music, but also to play it at a constant tempo. I again hired Noelle to compose the Mockingboard soundtrack, and uh, she actually converted the entire soundtrack, that's all seven tunes, from the C64 over to the Mockingboard, and it sounds fantastic. Obviously, the Mockingboard isn't quite as capable as Commodore's SID chip, but uh, just for a little comparison, here's the SID version using just two voices. And now the Mockingboard. She's actually using all three voices here, but one voice cuts out when the sound effects are played. Having the Mockingboard does more than just give us music though. Um, if you have a Mockingboard installed, it will use the timers to give the game a more consistent feel. So everything from the player's walking speed to the speed of the robots will be more consistent with the uh, C64 version and just more smooth in general. Also, fun fact, at the end of the game, it will tell you how long your game lasted. Now this is also consistent with the Commodore versions, but if you do not have a Mockingboard installed, this option is left blank like this after the game is over. And that's because it's nearly impossible to figure out the time uh, without some sort of timer. The Apple II version will ship in its own box. The color scheme is changed to green on the box manual and disc labels to help differentiate it from the Commodore version. The disc labels are already done as you can see and the boxes are in production now and the manual will go into production shortly. So the Apple II version should start shipping in May or June of 2021. And if you're a fan of the Apple II GS, there is also a dedicated port of the game in progress for it as well. Here's a couple of screenshots which um, is just about all I can show you at the moment. Obviously the 
graphics have been made from scratch, and uh, Noel will also be doing a dedicated music tracks for the 2GS sound chip, so stay tuned for more on that. Originally when the game was announced for the VIC-20 Pet and the C64, I received some criticism for not doing a Commander X16 release. And so my reasoning on that um, had a lot to do with the fact that, first of all, the machine just flat out didn't exist yet. It, it's, still, uh, it's still in development. In fact, a lot of the you know kernel routines and, and system calls and, and memory addresses and stuff like that were still sort of in flux and hadn't even been set in stone yet. And so I didn't want to write a lot of code. Uh, for something that was still, you know, changing. Um, that, of course, uh, has, has all been finalized now, so, so that's not an issue. Uh, but the other thing is, and, and I think this is probably the more, uh, or the bigger of the two problems, is that it's not just a matter of porting the game. I've got to develop a whole new tool chain. I'm going to have to create a whole new map editor. I'm going to have to create some kind of music tracker. Uh, and it's going to have to be a really nice one if you want to really take advantage of the sound chips in the X16, because... Up to this point, nobody's ever written anything like that. I mean, with uh, other established platforms, a lot of these kinds of tools already exist, and, and well, they just don't here. However, it occurred to me that I could create a Petski-only version of the game uh, without too much extra effort, and here it is. Uh, the game is using the same tile set from the C64 Petski version, and for sound, I ported over the sound engine from the Pet. All in all, it took maybe four days to get this version working. It doesn't really take advantage of any of the enhanced features on the X16. In fact, I'm only using 25 rows of text because that's what the game was designed for. So there's a few blank lines at the bottom since the X16 has 30 rows of text. Uh, nevertheless, it's fully functional and can play all nine maps. And while I use the emulator to develop it, the game does actually play perfectly on the real hardware. Um, this is Kevin Williams' board, uh, one of only three working prototypes of the Commander X16 at the moment. And um, I know everyone's asking for updates on this, and uh, there will be one coming soon. Uh, anyway, eventually, I hope to use the graphics from the Apple IIGS version for the Commander X16, so it should look really similar for the final version. Um, I also released a shareware version of the X16 game that can be downloaded for free, that has two maps, and you can play it in the emulator. And one last port being considered at the moment is MS-DOS. Now, this is a hand-drawn mock-up with CGA. And, uh, which is obviously where we'd want to start for compatibility, but then the 2GS artwork could be used for the um, VGA version as well. Unfortunately, um, this is a much bigger undertaking as it would require a complete rewrite since it would be for a different CPU. So, one last little thing I wanted to show off is a, a little easter egg. At the main menu of the game, you can press numbers 1 through 5 on the keyboard to hear various tunes of the game, like a jukebox. Planet X3 also does this. And of course, this is another nod to Ultima games from back in the day, which also had this behavior. And so I just can't tell you how thrilled I am that this game, which I originally envisioned for the pet, now runs on five different platforms, soon to be six uh, when the Apple IIGS version is complete. But that's going to be it for this episode. Uh, but because everything's real crazy right now and I haven't even been able to move back into my home yet and I've been shipping like crazy numbers of, of uh, games and stuff, I've been extremely busy. And uh, so I know that the, the spacing between the uh, episodes has been kind of long and it's probably going to be like two weeks between each episode for the uh, foreseeable future. So I thought I would at least give you a little preview about some of the episodes that you'll be seeing uh, coming up soon. So yeah, one of the uh, next things coming up is I'm just going to do a little quick video on this uh, clock that was donated to me. This is uh, still in the original packaging and uh, it's one of the first ever digital talking clocks. I know Techmoan recently did an analog talking clock, but, uh, but yeah, I think this is one of the first ever digital ones. So we're going to have a look at that. I'm going to do a restoration of an Apple II monitor that was found in more or less a landfill. Uh, it's been there for 15 years and somehow amazingly still works. And um, also I've finally acquired all the parts to build an Apple I, so I'm going to be building that and uh, doing a documentary on the design of Steve Wozniak's first computer. And finally, uh, doing that long overdue documentary on the Laser 128 and Laser XT. Yeah, so as you can see, some pretty cool stuff is in the works, and uh, I hope you stick around for all that. But uh, yeah, that's it for the moment. So uh, as always, thanks for watching.